South Central Florida, just above the Everglades and northwest of Big Lake Okeechobee. This is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters. Today is Monday. It's February the 22nd, 2016. It is a pleasure to be with you on a Monday night. I hope you had a good weekend and a good day. One down, four to go till Friday, but it is evening. And it is time for some Far Out Radio. Our resident 32nd degree Mason, Robert W. Sullivan IV, is back with us this evening. We have had many esoteric conversations with Rob about Masonic rituals, material covered in his book, The Royal Arch of Enoch, The Impact of Masonic Ritual, Philosophy, and Symbolism. We've also talked about Rob's fun 503-page movie book titled Cinema Symbolism. A Guide to Esoteric Imagery in Popular Movies. That's what we'll be covering this evening. Even though cinema symbolism is 503 pages of rich detail from the perspective of someone who has studied history, secret societies, philosophy, and religions, Rob had much, much more material he wasn't able to include in the book. So you know what that means? A follow-up book. Perhaps Son of Cinema Symbolism. Well, I doubt it, but I do like that title. Rob is still writing the follow-up, but there's plenty of material to cover this evening in this verbal sneak peek. And as I've said before, movies are the major art form in our modern world, so it's a good thing to at least know what's in your face while you're watching a movie. Now, most movies are just okay. Many are terrible, and a few are good to excellent. Of course, how one measures whether a movie is good or bad is subjective. Box office figures, while very important to film producers, are not a measure of a movie being good or bad. The recent movie, Star Wars The Force Awakens, grossed, get this, $2,039,913,590 in worldwide gross ticket sales. And that movie came out at the end of the last year. This makes the latest Star Wars movie the third highest grossing film of all time. Now, of course, that figure has a lot to do with the high price of the tickets. It also included the 3D version, which costs more to see. But still, that's a lot of tickets sold. Was it a good movie? Well, many weren't thrilled, but you can be assured that the movie was filled with symbolism, as are many modern films, which tells us that the writers and producers are very well versed on symbolism and occult a.k.a. hidden knowledge. There are also the films that are blatantly in your face about the occult, and those are pretty obvious. And unless you're very well versed in secret societies and occult, a.k.a. black arts, the most difficult symbology is often found in Disney films. Hmm. Well, regardless, movies are here to stay because we have a primal need to hear and tell stories. From the ancient times when we huddled around a campfire and listened to stories of the hunt, or stories from the past, to modern times when we watch movies on demand, the basic desire is the same. Tell me a story. Robert W. Sullivan IV is an author, a lawyer, a historian, theologian, philosopher, and a 32nd degree Mason. Rob's with us tonight. We'll be talking about his latest book, Cinema Symbolism. A Guide to Esoteric Imagery in Popular Movies. Rob's first book, The Royal Arch of Enoch, The Impact of Masonic Ritual, Philosophy, and Symbolism, is even bigger than the cinema symbolism. It's 690 pages. But if you're going to tell a story about the Masons, it's that complicated, really. Uh, And I would suggest that when the book goes into its second printing, that Rob includes a big fold-out flowchart. It would really help. Both books are available at Amazon.com in print and in Kindle format. And you can follow Rob's work at his website, Robert W. Sullivan IV. That's Robert W. Sullivan IV, IV for the fourth, dot com. Rob, welcome back to Far Out Radio. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me on. That's a fantastic introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's great to be back. I think the last time I was here was, what, back in October or so. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's great great to be back. Uh, thanks for having me on. Much appreciated. Thanks. This is fun stuff. I mean, I, I think the first time I actually sat down or lay down on the floor as a little kid and watched a movie, I was about, about five or six years old. And uh, it was really kind of a, I guess in retrospect, it's kind of a surreal experience. Um, that you know, I think one of those early movies was the day the Earth stood still. That's a pretty good way to get started. But they always, you know, yeah. I mean, they're fun. They seem better, bigger than life. And I think I was about six years old, and my big brother and I went to see the Alamo with uh, 
uh, John Wayne at the at the movie theater, you know, with a whole bunch of kids on a Saturday, and it was you know, not quite mayhem, but it, I remember it being pretty pretty loud. But you know, when you're that small and you're in a theater looking up at that giant silver screen, it's just it's all you know beyond bigger than life, and it just makes an impression. And I've been a movie fan ever since. No, uh, yeah, I mean, me too. I, that's exactly right. Um, I, I, I have, um, uh, you know, I, I really be lying if I can remember the uh, first movie I saw, but I remember at some point, and this was very early on, I remember going to see, um, this was in the theater, of course, this was in the in the 1970s, um, this was the original um, universal horror, or, you know, universal version of, of King Kong, you know, the one with Fay Ray, um, you know, where the giant ape winds up on the top of the Empire State Building, this was like in the 30s or something, I mean, this was obviously a re-release or, you know, redistribution in the 1970s, um, but, but I actually saw it in the theater um and yeah i mean it, it it's like you know you're a kid you're looking up at this giant screen seeing this giant you know you know monster running around um yeah i mean it, it leaves an it, it leaves an impression um and i remember just grow i mean i'm here in baltimore i just remember um you know having these very fond memories um of, of pre-cable days um you know of I, I, here in baltimore I, I imagine this is pretty much everywhere um this was obviously before cable tv we had a um a, a show on here um uh, that came on the um one of the channels it was you know the midnight saturday night monster rally show um you <laughs> know stuff. Uh, chiller theater yeah exactly this we had the, the one here in baltimore was called ghost toast and and they 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 reran all the all the you know universal horror movies you know with lugosi and karloff and then they got into some of the ones in the 60s with vincent price and i just remember being very very taken with those so yeah i mean i was a movie fan from from the very start that uh, king kong movie with uh, the original one used stop motion animation for the king kong uh, sequences, you know, when you actually got to see the ape, and it it's mighty impressive, you know, for 1930. What was that? 1933, somewhere somewhere back there. Something like that. That's right. Yeah. And if you know anything no, about no, stop right. motion, always, uh, yeah. No, go ahead. If you know anything about stop motion animation, that's stuff that nutters do. <laughs> That is so tedious. Yeah, I remember. Um, I remember watching that, and there was the one scene that I always that always stuck with me. It was the scene, in, you, you know, with the stop motion, um, and it's the scene where King Kong, I think, fights the giant serpent in that. Um, and that, that was always, I thought, you know, for the time, you know, like you said, even back then, that was that was very well done. And and uh, you know, that that was just one that I I, I I couldn't come on and swear that that was one of the first movies. I, I mean, it was. It may not have been the first movie I saw, but it was one of the first ones that I saw in a theater. Um, and you're right, it, it just uh, left an impression with me. Um, and then again, watching the old horror movies, and then at some point in the 1970s, I was still a kid. Um, I remember, uh, you know, and again, this is pre, you know, you know, HBO, Showtime. This was when there was only three or four stations, you know, on, on the TV. And I remember at some point in time, right around the same time frame, um, watching. This was my introduction to um, the western movie. Um, and the first western movie I watched was the um, spaghetti western, the Sergio Leone, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And I mean, and this was to me like the greatest movie I'd ever seen in my. My entire life. I mean, I just was so, so impressed. I mean, I'm watching this thing like, my God, I mean, this is, you know, as a kid, I mean, you got the three, you know, you got the three, you know, archetypal, you know, characters, the treasure hunt, the gunslinging, uh, the bad guy, the guy who's sort of neutral, the good guy. I mean, this was like the greatest movie that I ever seen. Um, and I'm pleased to announce that when we, with Cinema Symbolism 2, um, I'm doing a whole chapter on these uh, ar archetypes coming out of the Western world, uh, the Western movies, um, some very powerful imagery there as well. But The Good, The Bad, The Ugly was another one that really stuck with me that was so popular at the drive-in theaters that what are we talking about drive-in theaters yeah. yes folks younger yeah. folks you actually would get in your car and they charge you so much per car load i think uh and you went to this great big parking lot with uh, the asphalt was had a wave to it so that the closer you got up to the screen the more your car was tilted up so that you could better see the uh, the screen, and you watch these movies in the comfort of your car. Yeah, that's Fun right. Stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, and uh, I remember um, that that predates me a little bit, but I remember certainly um, watching uh, when TV was just you know four to five channels, um, and that was it. Um, and you know, you know, you you were held hostage. I mean, not held hostage, but you know, you you whatever they showed, that's what you watched. Um, and it wasn't like oh, I can you know I want to go watch Bella Lugosi's Dracula or The Mask of the Red right. Death. You know, I could just go you know, rent it on Blu-ray or Netflix or something like that, you know, or pull it up, 
pull it up anywhere, DVD or VHS. You know, you, you know, you had to wait for it to come on. And then even when uh, cable TV came around, you were still somewhat limited. They they showed you what they wanted to show. Um, sure. And then even with VHS tapes came around in the early 1980s. I mean, that took a while for a lot of this stuff to you know become become launched um, to, to, to come out. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it really probably wasn't until the early 1990s, you know, in the advent of DVD, where now this stuff is just readily you know available with the you know touch of a fingertip, you know, with a computer or Netflix. Or, or you know you want to buy it on DVD or Blu-ray. I mean you know it's it's, it's out there. You know you, know, you pay you pay a certain price for it. And you can just have it. But yo, know, I remember the day you know when you know if, if you know Bella Lugosi's Dracula was coming on or the Black Cat or the Raven. Um, I mean you stopped what you were doing and sat around the TV set and watched it with commercials and you know I mean it was just it was just a great experience and uh, you know you don't you, it's a time long long forgotten. Of course the commercials were just the perfect excuse to go get some more Coca-Cola and another bag of potato chips. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Ab- absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's like you said, um, you know, just doing this in the 1970s, it, it's just with the, these movies just left an impression on me. And, you know, I, I guess it carried forward with the uh, writing of the Royal Arch book with some of the Masonic symbolisms and then Cinema Symbolism 2, which is out. And then, of course, I'm, I'm doing Cinema Symbolism 2 right now. Probably, probably, you know, I, we, we'll get into that. Um, I would say Cinema Symbolism 2, as we speak tonight, is probably around 80% done. It's coming along very nicely and i'm real happy with the way it's come out I, alas and i knew this was going to happen it turned out about a couple months ago i was writing and i just started looking at this and uh, this is what happened in cinema symbolism and I, i'm just looking at cinema symbolism too i'm just thinking to myself you know again there there is just no way that i can incorporate all these movies that i want to talk about this book will go on forever so as it turns out and i actually had to excise some some movies out of cinema symbolism too which hopefully um you know which i, I guess i've begun outlining cinema symbolism three that's probably still a ways off but um you know again I, when i was doing cinema symbolism probably happened a couple months ago i'm just looking at the chapters i'm just looking at the movies i'm thinking to myself you know i mean if, if i if i do this i mean this will be like a thousand page book and it'll just go on and on forever so i cut out some of the movies that were originally going to go in cinema symbolism 2 put them in cinema symbolism 3 when i get around to that but uh i, I can report that cinema symbolism 2 is coming along very nicely and um i'd say as i sit here tonight on the phone with you probably somewhere between 75 and 80 percent done so yes yeah, it's, it's coming out great well, you got a great little franchise going there, and, and I hope it runs on. I hope you get a really good long run out of it. So, have you seen any good movies lately? Yeah, absolutely. Um, with uh, with Cinema Symbolism two, um, and this goes back to um, Cinema Symbolism one. When I did Cinema Symbolism one, I did the uh, three Lord of the Rings movies um, with with J.R.R. Tolkien. And again, my original plan was to do with, with Cinema Symbolism one to do the uh, Chronicle of Narnia movies with C.S. Lewis. I'm doing Cinema Symbolism 2 now. The original chapter was going to be the Lewis material and the three Hobbit movies. The last one, I think, just came out about a year and a half ago. And I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking to myself, well, that, that, that this will just go on forever. So I cut out the Hobbit movies, and I completed the three um, Narnia movies, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Prince Caspian, and Voyage of the Dawn Trader, Treader, excuse me. And um, I had never seen these movies. The first one came out in 05, the second one, I think, came out in 08, and the third one came out in 2010. And when I went into watching these, um, I had never seen them before. Um, I, I mean, I, I'd read the, the the first book as a kid. Uh, I think I'd read Prince Caspian as a kid. Beyond that, I really, I really, really never got into any more of the Narnia movies or books. There's about six of them um, out there. Most people know the first two, but beyond that, it gets a little more sketchy. But when I went into watching these movies, I, I was a little. I thought you're coming to be watching a kids movie. You know, you know, I got to sit through this. But I, I will be honest with you, Scott. I was very impressed with these three movies. I thought they were very well made. I thought they were as well done as the three Tolkien Lord of the Rings movies. Um, I thought they were very well acted. I thought the the storylines were great. I, I loved the veiled imagery in them. Um, I was impressed with them. Um, I, I thought they were moving. I mean, I, I thought at some points in, in the movie, you know, I, I got the message. that they, they were able to be moving without being campy or corny. So I would say, you know, if, if a person has not watched the three Chronicle of Narnia movies, these were the ones based on the C.S. Lewis stories, you know, you know, definitely check them out. I, I was very impressed with them. I, I thought I thought they were um, very well done. I got the chapter done. I, I've completed it, um, the, the esoteric breakdown um, of those three movies. And I, again, you know, I, I was very, um, you know, impressed with those, with those three films. One movie that we saw recently that for me, or actually for us, was a real surprise. It was titled Nightcrawlers with Jake. Yeah, this was the one I haven't Gillenfall. seen it yet. This was the one about, is this the one about the photographer or whatever? Oh, he's he's just sort of a crumb bum 
I don't know, kind of a scam artist guy trying to find his way. I mean, he's he's stealing metals and stuff and selling it for scrap, and he just stumbles upon uh, an accident and and gets a video camera and realizes that you know if I if I am willing to go out and run around at night with a with a police scanner and I can get to a, a crash scene first and capture some video, I can make some money at it. But he does it in a very unusual way. Uh, it's a strange movie and it has got an odd ending. Uh, and I, but we really liked it because it was very atypical. Really cool. Yeah, no, I haven't. Um, I haven't seen that one. I've seen ads for it, but um, I've I've not seen it. So um, you know, uh, I I, can't, I get asked all the time about movies that I haven't seen, but um, that's you know definitely one I'll have to check out. No question about it. It sounds like um, there was a guy who did this back in the um, in, in the fifties and sixties. He was a crime scene photographer. I forget his real name, but his, his nickname was Ouija. I mean, they called him that after the Ouija board. He had a police radio in his in his car, and and he would listen to crime reports, and then he would he would show up in photography. And photograph the crime, the crime, the crime scene before the police get got there. Hence, how he got his name Ouija. You know, he could see the future. And so it sounds a little bit like that. I forget the guy's real name, but I haven't seen it. But it's definitely one I'll have to check out. So where do you want to go here this evening with uh, your uh, cinema symbolism that you, we haven't talked about before? Yeah, well, I mean, we, you know, the the, the first book came out, and um, like I said, you know, you know, we could we could you know go go into that that a little bit. That's up to you. Um, I certainly don't mind giving a preview of Cinema Symbolism too. Some of the um, some of the movies in, in in Cinema Symbolism too that that I'm delving into the Narnia stuff, of of course, some very deep uh, Christian allegory, um, which I would call Neoplatonic allegory. We are we are getting into some of the Walt Disney movies. He gets a incredibly bad rap, um, and and doing the Disney portion, it is actually also debunking some of this some of this material out there um which is v very very false um when it comes to disney some of his movies um, i mean there are esoteric themes in some of them but it's 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 really you know much deeper than, than what what people what people some of the stuff you find on the internet so i've got a chapter on, on some of the walt disney movies and then again you know if you want to get into um some of the movies and cinema symbolism and certainly I, I think we've gone into the shining and dracula and some of those mm -hmm. before and some of the uh some of the cinema symbolism too some of the Alan Moore material, the From Hell movie, that, that is very interesting uh, with mm -hmm. Johnny Depp and uh, Heather Graham. That delves into Freemasonry and, and, and what is called Chaos Magic. That is a very interesting study with that. Some of the other, with some of the other chapters in Cinema Symbolism, too. Oh, David Lynch. Um, this is, uh, the, 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 he, 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 he invests his movies with, with some v very deep um, symbolism themes. But, but you know, I'm, I'm doing um, Blue Velvet. I'm doing the um, Dune. The, 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 that, that is very monomythic. That is, um, uh, you know, the Christ uh, Savior archetype um, in, in Dune. Mulholland Drive also I'm doing and Lost Highway. The original plan for the, for the David Lynch chapter was I was going to do um, the Twin Peaks television show, Twin Peaks Firewalk with me, and the other uh, Lynch movie called um, Wild at Heart. Um, I had to cut those out cinema symbolism three hopefully again that chapter would have just gone on and on i would never have gotten it done so um so that'll be in cinema symbolism three one day the david lynch material certainly walt disney um oh, i am i am redoing um i'm doing horror movies again um this time in in cinema symbolism two we are focusing on some specific horror movies i did this in cinema symbolism but i had some very just themes in dracula with frankenstein with wolfman i got into some of the more modern movies but in cinema symbolism two we are going to get into some very specific movies such as um suspiria that has some some very interesting uh, imagery in it the shining i i am really breaking down that hardcore in, in Cinema Symbolism 2. The Jacob's Ladder movie, this was a movie by Adrian Lyne that That's came out strange. in 1990. Some very alchemical um, themes going on, on in that one as well, uh, Transition of the Self. So these are some of the movies in Cinema Symbolism 2 that I, I, I'm working on. I, like I said, I would um, the Chronicle of Narnia stuff with, with C.S. Lewis also. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I said, it's probably around 80% done. Other movies um, that, that in that, uh, the Gangs of New York movie with Scorsese, um, some very deep religious allegory and, and that one as well drawing a blank on some of them but just just uh, a, a lot of brand new movies probably around 80 percent done right now and um coming along very nicely well you got a terrific format we got our music playing in the background so we're going to take a commercial break i'll tell you what sure. on the other side of the break 
dispel a few of these erroneous notions about the Disney films, if you will. Let's spend a little bit of time on that because uh, uh, Disney films, uh, you know, really get you know, kicked around. Uh, I've heard a lot sure. of the criticisms. I'm not so sure about them, uh, but uh, let's uh, have your take on it. So we'll do that on the yeah, other side. Yeah, absolutely. Take our commercial Sounds break. Great. If you're just joining us, Robert W. Sullivan is with us, and we're talking about his um, his uh, very popular book, Cinema Symbolism, A Guide to Esoteric Imagery in Popular Movies. We'll be right back. Just joining us, Robert W. Sullivan the Fourth is back with us. We're talking about his very popular book, Cinema Symbolism: A Guide to Esoteric Imagery in Popular Movies. And you can keep up with Rob's work at his website, Robert W. Sullivan the Fourth dot com. And it's uh, the Fourth is uh, spelled out I V Roman numeral style. All right, Rob. Well, on the other side of the commercial break, I, I said let's dig into some of these uh, Disney films. It seemed that in the 1980s they they produced a a lot of very dark storied films and these are generally marketed to children yeah i mean um the, with with the walt disney material and again with this I, I narrowed it down when i was doing this to some of the more uh, you know iconic disney films um i took on um but i, I did do some some of the modern ones i did uh, sleeping beauty and maleficent which with the maleficent movie with um, angelina jolie um mm -hmm. that had some very veiled imagery in this um in, in that as well sleeping beauty does too but Maleficent with Angelini Jolie does as well. I did the Cinderella and Snow White stories. The, these two, um, the, these stories come out of the Counter Reformation. Uh, Disney, there's a couple things that are out there with Walt Disney that are just false when, when it comes to this. Uh, there, there is a body of thought out there that a lot of this material that is, is of Disney's own creation. Um, this is false. Um, Snow White, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, these are fairy tales coming out of the world of, uh, you know, Charles Perrault, um, the Brothers Grimm, you know, being reinterpreted by him years later. So, so that, that is, uh, somewhat e erroneous. And, and there is another thing out there, um, and I, and I, I you know, I, I hear this all the time and it's just absolutely not true, is that, and, and even if it was true, it wouldn't bother me, but that Walt Disney was a Freemason. He is not. Walt Disney is not a Freemason. Um, there is absolutely no evidence that um, Walt Disney um, ever became a Freemason whatsoever. Um, he was in a group called D. Molay, um, and if you're not sure what that is, that is a and he, and he took it very seriously. Um, D. Molay is a group um, is, is basically what you would call the Masonic Boy Scouts. It is a it is a youth it is a youth organization run by Freemasons. Um, it, it, that's exactly what it is. It's the Freemasons version of the Boy Scouts. It's called D. Molay. Um, now, he was in that, but certainly that does not make a Freemason. Um, and evidence that one of the one of the things that people point to with with Disney is at, at Walt Disneyland. I think it, it's at is is there's a uh, Club 33, and this has always been said. Oh, this is the 33 degrees or whatever. I mean, I. It does sort of make sense, and he may have even have um, done that out of, out of an homage to the Scottish Rite. I mean, he was in Demolay, so that's certainly possible. But the evidence suggests that it was um, he had 33 sponsors at the time, and that that seems to be all it was. When you get into some of the more darker stuff with Disney, the the, the really the two movies that are kind of you know branded as children's movies that just really deal with some very dark themes are the two Witch Mountain movies. Um, these came out in the 1970s. Um, one is uh, Escape. What are they? Escape to Witch Mountain and return from Witch Mountain. These movies had some very dark imagery in them. Uh, you know, you know, some some very mature imagery, very mature themes that are hidden under the theme of of a Disney movie or of a children's movie. That that I that is absolutely true. An another bad rap against Disney um, is Fantasia, and and I, I just have recently watched that, and and you know he he gets beat up for the night on Bald Mountain portion of that, which is, you know, um, no, no running away from it, I mean, is this sort of satanic, well, you it know, is a sorcerer. Uh, anime, 
Yeah, animation. Well, well, the the the, the um, it's funny you mentioned that. If, if you watch Fantasia, it's eight segments. It's eight animated segments that the classical music. Um, the eight segments have nothing to do with each other. They're they're all standalones. Right. Out of the eight segments, there are only really two that contain sort of veiled imagery. Um, the Night on Bald Mountain, um, which is twined with Ave Maria, and the Sorcerer's Apprentice, which has some hidden imagery in it as well. You know, with with Mickey using the sorcery to turn the broom into a golem uh, to do the chores with the water and whatever. By and large, um, you know, when, when you're looking at the Walt Disney material, I mean, he really gets beat up. Um, he, re he really gets beat up in the world of conspiracy. I, I, I think a lot of it is, you know, when you start breaking it down, I mean, I think there's esoteric imagery. There's a lot of esoteric themes in it, but I, I don't see it as evil or malignant or mind controlling or anything like that. And certainly when you see it and you, you view it in the context, so I mean, like, for example, with Snow White and Cinderella, I mean, when you view those fairy tales in the, in, in, in the context of when they were produced, you know, the archetypes, you know, of uh, the Counter-Reformation, it sort of makes sense as to what's going on in those. And that's certainly what I tried to do in Cinema Symbolism, too, was sort of rationally explain some of the symbolism going on in, inside these movies. Another movie that I took on, I'll just get into this real quick, with, with Walt Disney was, um, and this was probably the most modern one um, that I did and think, well, the Lificent aside, was The Lion King, um, which I think came out in 1994. And again, you're dealing with a lot of um, Neoplatonic you know, you know, the Lion King, the Sun King, you know, we're getting into the Osirian mythology, you know, of, of the of the sun being betrayed by the darker figure, you know, and the and the and then the sun, you know, avenging the father. This is Osiris, Set, Horus, you know, which is Mustafa, Scar, and uh, Simba in in the Lion King. So so we have the uh, Egyptian mythology going on in, inside of Lion King. I mean, it's great stuff. I, I really enjoyed breaking it down, and I, I, I the. the Disney chapter, I, I know will not disappoint. There is some other very esoteric imagery going going on with Disney, and some 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 hidden themes, uh, things like that. But um, I, 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 I really, looking at it, I really found no evidence of some sort of evil Illuminati mind controlling themes in his movies. Well, on Fantasia, what's there not to love about the dancing ballet hippos? You know? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> It's just so sweet. However, I, I think a lot of this criticism uh, of the Disney films started to pile on in the 80s because they, they produced a whole bunch of movies. You know, and every time you go to the movie theater and there's a preview, it's, you know, the wonderful world of Disney. And it's like, oh, boy, you know, and here's Mickey and all this stuff. But some of the movies that they produced under this umbrella of Disney magic are, are very intense. Things like Something Wicked This Way Comes. Uh, the Haunted Mansion was uh, pretty intense. For These are marketed to small children. Uh, there was another one titled The Tower of Terror. Uh, there was another one called The Black Cauldron. Uh, you know, and some, and I, oh, the other one was uh, Watcher in the Woods with Betty Davis. And these are marketed to children, and these are just very intense, intensely negative stories. So I, I think they caught a lot of flack for that. Plus, you know, you, you can't, every Disney movie that comes out, or every Disney movie that's in production, at least two years, year and a half to two years before it comes out, every toy company is bidding on it to get the toy contracts. I know this, I used to work for a toy company, you know, and they were always trolling and waiting for the next Disney uh, uh, material to come out. So you've got that kind of uh, materialism and the heavy marketing thing, and, and when the movies come out, the stuff's just everywhere and the kids go bonkers over it. And a lot of times these are oh, not yeah. children friendly movies. Yeah, I mean I think I think some some instances with this with, with what you're talking about, I mean, I, I certainly found this in the Witch Mountain movies, um, and especially the sequel, um, which was um, Return from Witch Mountain. I mean, that that has some very, I mean, this was a movie that was marketed to children. I mean, this has some very dark themes in it. Some Sometimes I, I am led to believe that, that some of these, these more mature themes are somewhat aimed at the adult. I mean, in, in the end, the adult is sitting next to the child, so I, I think to some extent, um, that that may provide an explanation. And I know in, in some instances, when it when it comes to Disney, whether you like it or not, I mean, I know in in you know there are these, sometimes there are these little subliminal images going on um, in in the background. I know in in Lion King, and it, it's hard to see, but it does appear there. And and you know this this is been a bad rap. People say, oh, this proves you know this is a sex cult or whatever. In Lion King, there's a scene 
it's really hard to see. You can't even see it unless you're really looking for it. I mean, you basically have to pause. You have to basically have the, the movie on DVD or Blu-ray and pause it to see it. There's a scene where Simba is, is on, a, cl- on, a, on a ledge, and he lays down, and a dust cloud comes, comes up. And as the dust cloud's fading off, I, I, I believe you can see the word sex in the dust cloud, S-E-X. And, and, you know, this is, you know, you know, oh, this is, you know, this evil satanic sex cult in Walt Disney. I mean, well, the, the real truth of the matter is, I mean, this is probably just an animator, you know, just screwing around, basically. Um, well, just kind of, you know, yeah, exactly. They'll, they'll do that. But it's next to impossible to see. I just was watching The Lion King the other day. So, I mean, you know, but, but when it comes to what you're talking about, I mean, I, I don't really dispute that. I mean, it, it has caused in some instances, you know, this negative reputation. I mean, the one, the, the Witch Mountain movie, the sequel, I mean, that, that has some very, very, very dark imagery in it where the one kid who has magical powers is abducted. Um, he's mind-controlled by by the, the Christopher Lee villain. Betty Davis is in, in this one also. And, and Christopher Lee mind-controls him, and while he's mind-controlling him, I mean, he tries to have him kill his sister. He tries to he have a, a nuclear reactor meltdown. I mean, you know, very mature, you know, cata- you know catastrophic themes. And this is geared for children. So yeah, I mean, you know, you know, you know, you, you look at it and you say, you know, what the, what the hell is going on here? But it, it's it's just like hidden behind the guise of a, of a children's movie. But I mean, I, I don't dispute that. I mean, it is in some instances this very dark imagery and and themes um, that has been packaged for for children. Jeez, I'm. I'm way past being a child. I don't think I'd want to be mind controlled by Christopher Lee. <laughs> He's a frightening yeah, guy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, if, if you watch, if you watch Return from Witch Mountain, the two villains in that are Christopher Lee and and, and Betty Davis. Betty Davis's Golden Age. This came out around like 1978 or so. Betty Davis's Golden Days were obviously long behind her at that point. They they get their hands on one of the kid, the, and the kid, the two kids have magical powers. Is um, this Watcher and, and in the Lee, Woods? I don't think I've seen that one. Okay. The Watcher in the Woods. Yeah, that's that's got that had Betty Davis in it. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, when 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 at that point in her career, you know, she was kind of playing the heavy in the, in the Disney movies. Um, mm-hmm. I think she was in another one too. It escapes me right now. But just to wrap up, yeah, I mean, if if you ever watch um, Escape from Witch Mountain, which is the sequel, and you take your goggles off that this is a kids movie um you're going to find some very very dark esoteric themes and imagery um going on inside that movie when my daughter was about four or five years old uh we decided to take her her mom and i decided to take her to the to the movie theater you know she'd seen movies on our you know vi- videotape of movies but you know we'd say, oh let's take her to the movies benji the hunted is out it's a disney film so they sat down they got their seat and I went off to get the popcorn, the soda, and the chips. By the time I came back, poor Benji, within two minutes, was involved in a shipwreck. He got washed ashore on a strange island. He was almost attacked and eaten by a by a, 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 a tiger or something. And by the time I sat down, all of a sudden, my, my daughter's going, I don't like this movie. This is a bad movie. I want to get out of here. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, Mom it's, said, um, come on, we're going. Yeah, I, I mean, the... Yeah, I mean, you look at like intense. Dumbo and yeah, and Dumbo and Bambi can be very depressing. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 you know, you, you know, you you start looking at. But when you get into stuff like with with that, you know, I guess you know you're looking at it as well. It's going to have a happy ending and stuff like that. I mean, even Cinderella and Snow Oops. White, you you know, had to fight off an evil stepmother, an evil you know godmother, whatever the one is in Snow White. The, the, I think it's a stepmother also, the evil queen. So you know, in, in the end, it's it's presenting a you know trial and a conflict they have to go through. But in the end, it does have a happy ending. I don't know if I ever saw the Benji movie, and you know, it's you funny with. with just yeah with with just getting back real quick to the witch mountain movies i actually saw um those two in the theater i actually my mother and father took me to see the two witch mountain movies and at the time as a kid i never really you know i just kind of sat there and watched it and didn't really leave a negative impression with me it wasn't until i was really doing the study you know and i kind of remembered those two and and those always you know I, i just remember 
I, those were two that I just always remembered were the two Witch Mountain movies. Um, mm-hmm. I guess because I had seen them in the th- theater, and when I was watching them for the for the book, just just how much esoteric imagery and the occult and mind control, and you know, I mean, it was just like wow, you know, h- how did this ever get past the censors that this could be, you know, geared for for a child? So I do what understand, um, you, you know, I do understand the uh, negative attitudes towards Walt Disney, but you know, I, I really couldn't put my fingers on, um, you know, this Illuminati you know, devil worshiping uh you know, side that that is that is often out there. And that's exactly right with Fantasia who doesn't like dancing alligators and hippopotamuses and elephants for God's sakes. Absolutely. Uh let's I wanna ask you about two movies that came out last year, twenty fifteen. I don't know if you had a chance to see uh let's see, uh Spectre, the latest James Bond movie, and the latest Mission Impossible Rogue Nation film. Now, I I didn't see either one of them. We will see them when they come out on uh, Netflix or DVD or whatever when I have some more time. But uh, these are two uh, uh, franchises that are the the veil isn't too dense with regard to you know well what do you exa- what exactly are we talking about here we're talking about you know CIA types and uh, you know secret societies and organizations and yikes you know I never I haven't um, I haven't seen Spectre or the Mission Impossible movie um, I, I saw one of the Mission Impossible movies years ago um, I really wasn't too impressed with it I think it was one of the first ones I like the James Bond material when you when you're dealing the James I did the James Bond material of course in cinema symbolism I, I think we probably talked about that before but when when you're dealing with the, the James Bond material there's only so much out there you know with the original source material with Ian Fleming in fact when you get into the James Bond material when you get past some of the Roger Moore material. At that point, that's the end of the of the Ian Fleming stuff. So the stuff that's being made with like Timothy Dalton um, and today, this is just you know of their own conjuring, um, as it were. This is just you know studios writing scripts. You know the, the Ian Fleming material has been you know long exhausted. Now when you get into Spectre, you're getting you know I mean that does come out. The Spectre organization does come out of the world of Ian Fleming with Blofeld and stuff like that. And but I, ha- I haven't seen the Spectre movie. Um, you know again. And it's on my to watch list, and I'll probably check out the Mission Impossible movie at some point in time. But no, um, the James Bond material, and like I said, I'm not going to rehash it. But um, that's steeped in occult and mysticism. I'm sure we've talked about that before. Um, mm-hmm. And if you're interested in that, check out Cinema Symbolism. I have a whole chapter on John Dee, Ian Fleming, Aleister Crowley, and the and the occult world of uh, James Bond. There's a terrific PBS miniseries. I think there are only five installments. And it's called uh, Fleming, the man who would be Bond, and it's about Ian Fleming, and what a what a goofy ne'er do well he was until he got into the uh, into the uh, war war effort there, working for the British government, and that's when he really hit his stride. But up to that point, uh, he was sort of a a floater trying to make money as a stockbroker, and you know at one point he had a client that said, "You are the worst stockbroker in the world." <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, Fleming Fleming is an interesting character. He was, um, I mean, I, I I can't remember what it was, but I think he, I mean, he he does not live very long. Um, no, he, he I, I want to say he was fifty two. So yeah, fifty two, fifty four, fifty six. Yeah, he was a, a ten pack a day smoker. Yeah, and and I mean, if you read stories about him, it was basically from um, the minute he woke up to the minute he went to bed, there was a cigarette in his hand. Um, yeah. And in fact, I don't think I've ever seen a photo of him without a cigarette in his hand. Um, just an incredibly heavy, heavy smoker. The James Bond books he wrote, um, that they, some of them deal with uh, real life stories in the world, world, excuse me, in World War II. Again, we have the Aleister Crowley influence. We have the 007 with John D. We have a lot of hermetic esoteric esoteric imagery going going on inside those things but Fleming Fleming was writing the Bond books for around eight or nine years and it was really you know when the when the first Hollywood movie started to come out you know you know he was working on those books I mean I think he'd written about ten of them before Hollywood took an interest in them um, and and right as the Bond global phenomenon sensation you know was taking off is when he dropped dead and you know I, I, he probably never really got to see the full fruits of his labor but um 
Yeah, I mean, he's an interesting character, to say the least. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you if you like the James Bond stuff like I do, and especially the, the Sean Connery material, you know, and even some of the Roger Moore, and just the background, the background of the stories. I mean, some of the movies veer off of, off of what, you know, off, off of the stories. Um, I mean, like, I know Moonraker, you know, where they take place in outer space. That has nothing to do with the Ian Fleming novel. The, 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 the Fleming novel has Hugo Drax in it, but he's trying to revive the Nazi V2 project to level London. It has nothing to do with going into outer space or anything like that but yeah just just if you're interested in james bond definitely check out cinema symbolism i have a whole chapter on the uh what i like to call the occult world of uh, ian fleming fascinating stuff after watching that movie or that miniseries fleming the man who would be bond i i got interested a little more interested in ian fleming read a bunch of articles about him <clears throat> came across an interview with uh uh, Sean Connery, and in the preface to the interview, it made the distinction that Sean Connery was not Ian Fleming's uh, first, second, or third pick uh, for uh, uh, James Bond. He wanted Stuart Granger, uh, or and he had a couple other actors that uh, you know were, were more box office. But apparently, uh, Connery was willing to work uh, relatively cheap, you know, for for that kind of a thing. But uh, Sean Connery eventually met Ian Fleming. And in an interview, he, of course, the interviewer said, so what was he like? And he said, he was a total snob. He was an absolute snob. <laughs> he didn't like me, and I didn't like him. Oh, well. Yeah, I mean... I'm yeah, I mean, these guys, you know, a lot of these guys are very eccentric, of, uh, you know, very odd. Um, you find this also just, you know, with um, Aleister Crowley. Um, he was the exact same way. Um, Crowley, you know, he had this inherent character flaw. Um, I know of nothing else. I mean, again, you know, you know, I mean, he is such a hard character to pin down. You know, he, he had this proclivity of just dumping on people who genuinely cared about him. I and mean, you find it over and over again with Crowley that he constantly like to destroy people who were really interested in what Crowley had to say and were really interested in Aleister Crowley's teachings. And for whatever reason, Crowley just always turned against these people at some point in time. I mean, he let them stick around for a little bit, and, and he let them hang around, and he'd give them some instruction, and, and you know, that, but then for some reason, you know, he, he would just turn against them and just, just you know, throw them under the bus. Um, in fact, one, one of his I, I don't know the exact circumstances of this, but I believe one of his apprentices, a guy named, um, oh, what's his name? Well, I, I, his name's escaping me. Um, well, one of his apprentices, a person who was very interested in what he had to say, uh, killed himself over this. Um, so, you know, I mean, you know, and, you know, Fleming, you know, comes out of this strange, you know, the strange world of British intelligence. But, I mean, that that, wouldn't, that doesn't surprise me that, uh, you know, you know what, what Connery says. I mean, I mean, by all accounts, you know, Fleming was a pretty eccentric character. Well, Fleming's family background was they were they were sort of like lower echelon society people. I mean, they knew how to dress, they knew how to speak, they knew which fork to use, and all that kind of stuff. But they, their position was a little on the lower rung. I, I don't remember exactly what the uh, what the connection there was, but he knew enough to behave in certain circles. But very much like the uh, the movie uh, Barry Lyndon, you're only ever going to go so far. Because you're not one of us is basically where, where it came down to. So, but anyway, we got about a minute yeah. or so left. Anything you want to squeeze in here? Uh, you know, other films that you didn't cover in the first book that you got into in the second book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're going to do, um, we're doing a whole chapter on Alan Moore. We're doing David Lynch. We're doing um, the Western movies, um, the Good, the Bad, the We're doing all three of the Spaghetti Westerns, um, the Good, the Bad, the Ugly, Fits Full of Dollars, Few Dollars More, The Magnificent Seven. Um, I, I, I'm doing the masculine archetype. Uh, really, the template is a movie with John Wayne called Red River. Um, I'm doing all the Harry Potter movies in Cinema Symbolism 2, the Chronicle of Narnia stories. Um, I have a whole chapter on Disney, Gangs of New York with Martin Scorsese. Um, that has some very deep religious allegory and, and really presents sort of what I call a lost history of the United States, which is very important. That that movie does a very good job of presenting that. We are getting, I'm going to do, um, you know, when you get into this ancient mythology and these folklore, um, I have a whole chapter on Robin Hood. This is very Kabbalistic. Um, again, we're dealing with archetypes um, coming out of uh, Kabbalah and Tarot embodiment. Um, we wow. are re I'm revisiting 
revisiting I am revisiting um, some of the alchemical storylines of Black Swan. Um, it's, again, it's about 80% done. I'm also working on a work of fiction. So check out my website, robertwsullivaniv.com. And thank you, I Scott, will, for having me on tonight. I, I, thought I it was will a terrific keep checking show. it out. I will keep checking it out until the movie's out and the, or the book's out. And then when the book's out, we'll have you back on again. Absolutely. All right, terrific. Rob, thanks a lot. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Take care. That is our program for this evening. Thanks for being with us on a Monday night. Coming up this coming Tuesday or Friday night, our pal Dr. Bernie Suarez will be with us. Bernie is uh, he's a critic of uh, social media and the mainstream news media. And uh, with the way the media has been behaving with this presidential election, Dr. Bernie and I will have lots to talk about. It's a very rich subject. Have a great week. Take care. Be well. And we'll be back on Friday with more Far Out Radio.